Good afternoon and welcome to Inside the Fairbanks. My name is Hannah Buckner and I'm an AmeriCorps educator here at the museum. Today I am on the balcony level of the southwest corner of our museum and uh, we will be taking quite a journey through time today. We're going to be stepping back through time as we go and look at some of the ancient organisms that we have here that have been casted. So instead of um, having simply just fossils, we have casts of them, which makes them um, definitely less prone to damage. So we'll be taking a look at some of those that we have of um, some dinosaurs, some ancient horses, and some sea life. So let's get started. Sit back, relax, and uh, maybe grab your favorite time travel drink, and uh, let's take a look. So for the first stop today, we're taking a look at um, the casts that are in this case. Uh, for the first part, we're going to be taking a look at these five casts that are on the left. Um, you'll be able to see a ichthyosaurus, um, which is right here. We're going to see a plesiosaurus, which I believe is um, kind of the, the Nessie looking dinosaur right here. Then we have a megalosaurus, which was a carnivorous dinosaur. Um, all of these have existed during, um, well, these existed during the, uh, the Jurassic period. Um, then we are seeing the iguanodon, which was an um, herbivorous dinosaur, meaning he ate only vegetation. And uh, these dinosaurs lived during the early cre uh, Cretaceous period. And we see a pterodactyl, which was a flying reptile. That sounds quite terrifying. And a labyrinthodon, which was an amphibian. And um, the pterodactyl lived around the same time as the iguanodon. And uh, the labyrinthion lived at a different time. And so um, they may not necessarily be to scale, but they definitely show us some interesting ways of how life has changed and how they look. Megalosaurus looks a lot like a, <laughs> uh, like a wolverine, just with claws. And then iguanodon definitely still looks like an iguana, just with longer legs. Over here, we have a Diplodocus, and this was made by Charles Knight. Um, and this was an, herbi <laughs> an herbivorous dinosaur during the late Jurassic period. Um, you can definitely tell that it's a Diplodocus by its long head. I mean, its long neck and its very small head. These are my favorite dinosaurs. And it shows this dinosaur just looking very majestic while standing on a cliff. Next up, we're going to be seeing some mammals. Um, so while reptiles were definitely the predominant form of life on Earth from 23 million to 65 million years ago, there were so many different animals that lived um, on Earth at the same time. Uh, we quite see that there were tons of small um, dis uh, ancestors of horses, um, some armadillos, um, wildebeest, ancestors to wildebeest, and mammoths. So what we're seeing today that we have of casts are these two skulls here and here, and then we have this horse leg. So this skull is, I may pronounce this wrong, but a Peleotherium, and that is a small horse-like mammal, and you can see that here, it's number one. It almost looks like a capybara face, and then two is kind of similar. It's got a much longer snout with um, definitely some more teeth intact. You can see that the joint is a little bit more um, wider than this one, so the head was definitely more elongated. We can see that it's an enoplotherum, which is number two, right here. Oops, sorry, number two. And then this horse leg 
which is number four, is a, th is a three-toed horse. Um, I don't know if horses now these days have less than that or more than that, but um, they definitely had the look of a horse back then. Um, so this was definitely the precursor to the horse that we have now. You can also see another three-toed horse is um, in number three. Next that we're seeing, um, we're going to be seeing some parts of history about 350 to 290 million years ago when there was um, definitely good conditions for growth of uh, wet lowland forests um, on the continent. And so there were tons of um, smaller plants that we are familiar with, such as mosses or horsetails. Um, and they grew to the size of trees because there was so much carbon in the air. This period is known as the carbon, Carboniferous, um, which is named for the vast oxygen poor swamps that um, where dead vegetation, instead of decaying and releasing carbon, um, they accumulated and compacted into coal. So um, they became hardened and rocked. Um, and so one thing that we have is that we had a fossil of a uh, dragonfly and it got caught in coal and so we were able to make a cast of it. And you can see it's very detailed. Um, you can see kind of just like the detail on the wings and the back. It's very spiny. Um, it's a very beautiful cast. So next we are going to be seeing some fish. So uh, the Devonian period had a lot more diverse fish and marine life, well, freshwater fish and marine life. Um, so the term fish is, is referring to aquatic life forms that developed a cranium or a head, skull, um, a nerve cord, and internal and external skeletal structures. And this period, which was 410 to 360 million years ago, um, it, this had groups of fish that developed fins and pectoral fins or, you know, fins that are on its back and just different ways of feeding. And so um, this fish um, is called a hemicyclaspis, um, which was an early um, Devonian jawless fish with a bony head. So we see the cranium, which is here, and um, where if it did have pectoral fins, it would have been right here. Um, but its body was armored and it would allow it to be able to eat without really getting eaten. Um, but fish that lived in this time would have been destroyed by massive extinction about at the end of 360 million years ago. So we don't have any more like this, but it definitely is reminiscent of um, stingrays. Next to the fish, we have the case with the echnoderms. And so these are actually very interesting. They may look very familiar to you. Um, echnoderms have existed since the Cambrian period. Um, they are marine animals that are covered with plates or spines, and they are uh, radially symmetrical. So um, on top, they look the same. Um, some echnoderms are fixed in place, like um, sea lilies, um, but sea urchins and starfish are free swimming. So you might actually recognize that these look like sea fish, starfish, and then this doesn't, but it, it is the same species. And so it's very interesting how, um, you know, there are species that have been extinct for some time, but the ones that have been around, they've pretty much maintained very similar shape to what they had before. So next to the brachiopods and the cephalopods are a case or cases, but this one specific case is, case is the mollusks and the brachiopods. And so the, the two casts that we have of these are these two shells here. This is a spiral one, and um, I don't quite know this one's name, but they're definitely interesting. Um, you can see that this one is very spiny, and it has a very regular shape as it goes down, and the animal would have had its body coming out over here. Um, and then this one is just so interesting because I can't even tell where it would start. But so basically, mollusks and brachiopods are bottom dwellers, um, but 
uh, you could tell at that time like what they looked like just because of their shell. And so mollusks have one or two equal shells and feed by filtering water or crawling slowly over the bottom. But brachiopod pods um, have two uneven, unequal shells and they were pretty common um, during the Paleozoic era, but have since been overshadowed by mollusks. And then lastly, uh, we're going to be looking at the trilobites. So these are really cool. Um, their names remind me of Star Trek and the Tribble, um, but they were named for their three lobe structure. So um, if you can see, all of these have three sections of their skeletons. One, two, three, one, two, three, and then one, two, three. They were the most abundant arthropod during the Cambrian period, and there were over 2,000 different species that inhabited the marine environment. Um, they could only really be a few inches long, like crabs, um, but they were the first among creatures to have eyes. And so their fossils were found throughout rock systems in the, of the Paleozoic era, um, but unfortunately became extinct about 230 million years ago. So unfortunately we don't see them around anymore, but you can definitely see them here. And they do look very reminiscent of crabs. But this one looks like a sea turtle to me. So that's it for today. Thank you so much for joining me. And um, I hope you really enjoyed learning more about our um, cast that we have here on the southwest corner. And um, hopefully you'll get to see them soon in person. And um, yeah, thank you for joining me. And um, on to you, Bo. Thanks, Hannah, for that great video. Um, so I'm going to talk now a little bit about uh, the cast uh, here at the museum. and. Uh, the history of how they came here and why why we purchased them uh, when we did and um, why they are significant. So uh, I'm going to share my screen here with you um, for a bit and um, we'll get started. <clears throat> so um, here uh, you can see one of our display cases at the museum in uh, the balcony level. Um, Franklin Fairbanks, when he was first collecting his, uh, for his uh, cabinet of curiosities, which was housed in his home here in St. Johnsbury in Undercliff, um, collected mostly local, locally related natural history and some exotic things like exotic birds, but, um, and a lot of um, ethnographic type materials, but he did not collect very much in terms of paleontology and fossils. Uh, you can see a here a few of the uh, fossils that he did have, uh, some fish um, here, but again, uh, he didn't have that many um, things uh, that he was able to donate uh, in terms of fossils with the collections. Um, when he donated, donated his collection to form the core of the initial museum, um, which was uh, founded in 1889 and opened uh, to the public in 1891. Um, so uh, during this time, uh, late 19th century, when there were um, a lot of museums being opened and founded, um, there was a, a need to fill that paleontology gap. And um, a man named Henry Ward was um, someone who uh, was born in 1834, uh, um, was very interested in uh, fossils and paleontology from an early age. And when he was in his 20s, he um, traveled to Europe and uh, visited a lot of the museums there at the time. And was amazed by and very um, drawn to the fossils that he saw there and was, um, he knew that a lot of the people in um, the US would never be able to get to Europe and travel and see them all. So he wanted to find a way to um, share that with people. And um, uh, he also loved museums and wanted to, help uh, the museums in the U.S. Um, get started um, and um, 
so uh, and fill their gaps in their early collections. So he uh, coordinated with um, <clears throat> people uh, at the museums uh, in Europe where the, a lot of these uh, significant finds were, and um, he uh, <clears throat> was able to make uh, molds of uh, the a lot of these significant uh, fossils and then cast replicas of them. And in 1862, he formed uh, Ward's Natural uh, Science Establishment and um, started producing these um, casts to sell primarily to museums. <clears throat> and uh, Ward's did sell other things like taxidermied mounts and skeletal material. And uh, the Fairbanks Museum purchased uh, some of those as well from the museum, from Ward's. But um, one, one of the most significant things that we um, have at the Museum from Wards is the um, Casts collection, um, which uh, at the moment we have about 80 uh, casts from Wards. Uh, there used to be more than that, um, but over the years through use and uh, in educational programming, um, they some were worn out and others um, were intentionally discarded and we'll get to one significant uh, one of those uh, a little bit later on. Um, so um, in uh, early, the early 1890s when Franklin, after the museum had been established uh, and Franklin Fairbanks was trying to uh, fill it out and round it out um, to be a more a uh, complete museum as he saw it um, in his vision. He um, obviously heard about wards and um, contacted them and um, <clears throat> about acquiring specimens. And um, we have a number of records in the collections, uh, letters from Ward to uh, um, fr uh, Franklin Fairbanks. And um, <clears throat> Uh, ultimately, we um, purchased a number of casts, including this one, this dragonfly, from them to uh, fill out the uh, fossil collection. And um, Henry Ward <coughs> um, loved museums uh, so much, and he came here to um, the Muse Fairbanks Museum to help uh, unpack and install um, the collections. <coughs> especially um, the largest one that we purchased, uh, which was a Glyptodon, which we'll talk a little bit more about uh, in a bit. Um, but here, uh, this um, dragonfly fossil um, has, uh, is one of the one that has a lot of really good detail on it. It's, um, this one's not that big. It's about seven inches by five inches. Um, this is a page from the 1866 um, catalog that Ward's put out uh, to advertise their um, the casts that they um, uh, were offering. And uh, this, you can see here, is the back of the, the fossil cast. And this is the original catalog number. Um, I suspect this was written on there by someone at Ward's um, and before it came to the museum. And so it's amazing that that is still there and legible. Um, and you can see here is a little paper label that was the museum's catalog number from when um, it arrived at the museum and was entered into the cataloging system that we had um, at the time in the 1890s. Um, here's another example of a uh, early type of fish that we had. Um, uh, that we have here at the museum. Um, this one a, was a little bit more expensive than that um, dragonfly that we just saw. It's a little bit bigger. Um, of course, a, a dollar and 50 cents uh, went a lot, lot farther, um, further than we, uh, it goes now. Um, and this uh, <coughs> fossil cast is one of the largest ones that we have um, still. It's uh, this number 227, uh, the Pleosaurus, and um, it's about two feet nine inches by two feet six inches. And um, this one um, 
uh, used to hang here in the uh, upstairs classroom lecture hall. Um, right, you can see it right here. Uh, this is an image from the museum's archives, and along with uh, some a cast of some foot, fossilized footprints and an ichthyosaurus cast here, both of which we still have in the collections. And um, the fact that these were displayed so prominently in the lecture hall shows that they were how uh, lucky we were to have them and the significance that was placed on them um, when even when they first came here. Um, and as large as that uh, Pleosaurus was, it was far from the largest uh, uh, cast that Ward's made. Here we can see one of the largest ones that they did that they made, uh, which is a life-size replica, as almost all of them were, of the original cast, or sorry, the original fossil that was found. This one um, you can see was found near Whitby, England, and it um, is in the Natural History Museum over there, and uh, this one was 22 feet, eight, 8 inches long by 12 feet, 6 inches tall, and was priced at $150, which was about um, $4,300 in today's, um, uh, what, what it would we would have to spend to get that today. Um, so, uh, and the um, there are only five of these, this particular a cast known to still exist um, in the world, including this one at the Smithsonian. So uh, these were, the wards really uh, was uh, such a significant force in, uh, or contributor to uh, early museum, natural history museums, especially in the US, but uh, around the world as well. Um, they, uh, museums of all sizes uh, purchased casts from wards uh, from the small, very small museums like the Perkins Geology Museum at UVM, uh, obviously the Fairbanks Museum, and all the way up to the larger museums like the American Museum of Natural History and um, the Smithsonian purchased uh, uh, a lot of casts of these fo uh, significant fossils from from wards and. Um, so, the largest one that the museum, the Fairbanks Museum, ever had was this one, the Glyptodon, which um, was, you can see this um, person standing next to uh, this in this uh, image here. Um, this also was uh, cost about $150, although the museum, Fairbanks, that included the pedestal, and the Fairbanks Museum paid $145 according to the letters that we have from uh, Henry Ward, uh, because the museum provided or built its own pedestal, although it was to the um, specifications provided by Wards. Um, <clears throat> and um, so this one um, was originally displayed here in the middle of the main floor. Uh, many of you might recognize this, uh, probably will recognize this diorama here, which is the Muskrats diorama that we have at the museum, which was created by William Balch in 18, uh, about 1895. And one thing that he did was to photograph um, almost all of his dioramas as he, as he completed them. And most of the time they had a, a backdrop, a cloth backdrop behind it um, so that you would focus on the diorama. But in this case, um, he didn't do that for some reason. And it's lucky for us because we also get this snapshot of what the um, museum looked like uh, circa 1895 or 96. Um, and um, luckily it captured this, uh, the clip's done here. And um, the fact that it's prominently displayed in the middle of the main floor of the museum, uh, I think shows the, and illustrates the significance that was, that this uh, Glyptodon had um, in re representing the current thinking of the time, scientific thinking and the importance they placed on these new discoveries. Because even though some of these 
uh, fossils that these casts were replicas of uh, were a few decades old, they were still, it was still a fairly new field and um, that, that is paleontology. And uh, the fact that Fair, the Fairbanks Museum was able to display uh, something like this was uh, really pretty significant. Um, so it was given this um, place of, uh, of importance. Um, and then over the years, uh, you can see in these two images, also from the museum's archives, um, this one, uh, as the museum added more dioramas, the glypsodon was moved around. You can see it just peeking out here uh, behind uh, the flamingos diorama, and then um, and the, another case. And then here, we've added a few more uh, of the dioramas, um, including the uh, Birds of Paradise, uh, which we talked about last week, and uh, a couple of others, and the glyptodon is talked back here again. And then ultimately, um, by the uh, late 19-teens, all of the medium and large size dioramas were in place on the main floor, so there was much less um, room for something like the glyptodon. And um, it was moved up to this room, which uh, was known as the Colonial Room, uh, which was where the um, uh, planetarium is now and held a lot of the historical collections um, that the museum had, like this um, wagon that the Fairbanks uh, family came to St. Johnsbury in from Massachusetts, um, and which is now at the St. Johnsbury History and Heritage Center here in St. Jay, and um, a lot of other historical materials. and. Um, this photo illustrates um, how well this um, model really, or this cast really cap, um, captivated people and held their attention. These two boys are, um, you can see very intently looking at uh, the label for the, the, the Glyptodon cast. Um, so uh, a little bit of a museum secret here is um, that when the planetarium was being installed in the 1960s, the, uh, this cast was seen as not as scientifically relevant or important or even accurate uh, as it had been, um, even though it was taken from a, you know, modeled on a, and the mold that this was made from was taken from a, an actual fossil. Um, it wasn't deemed that significant. So, and they needed the space to put it in the planetarium. So uh, the director at the time um, instructed uh, employees to smash it with a sledgehammer and literally throw it out the window, um, according to the story that I've heard um, from a couple of people who were here at the time. And so unfortunately, we no longer have this um, glyptodon um, model. Luckily, um, there are other examples of this um, cast in other museums, including uh, Wesleyan University in Connecticut. Um, and I know there's a museum in Canada that has one as well, um, some of which were stored for a time and then brought back out of storage and um, you know, cleaned and restored and reassembled. Um, and I know the one at Wesleyan was recently um, put back together and um, put back on display. Um, so the last casts, or not casts, but models that we're going to talk about today are these five, which are a set of models of dinosaurs, um, also produced by wards, um, that were representations of what uh, people thought museum uh, dinosaurs looked like um, during, um, yeah, what they thought people, dinosaurs looked like. Um, and uh, they are Petrodactyl, Iguanodon, Ichthyosaurus, uh, Pleosaurus, uh, Megalosaurus, and Labyrinthodon. And um, these models were based on, um, and here's the, uh, before we get to that, the pages from Ward's catalog. Uh, they purchased them for um, a, as a set for $30, which was again, uh, several hundred dollars in today's um, 
value, um, or you could buy, buy them individually. Um, so these were based on the ones that Ward's made based on uh, models like this, which looks obviously very much like the, um, the Megalosaurus that Ward sold uh, that um, Benjamin Waterhouse Hawkins made in the late 1840s, early 1850s um, in preparation for making his full size um, scale models for the 1851 Crystal Palace exhibition, uh, exhibition in London, which was uh, the World's Fair for that year. Um, and he made a whole series of um, these prehistoric creatures, uh, some of which are still um, in existence there. And um, again, they were based on, these models were based on actual fossils, um, but were, there was a very, a uh, few, there were, were very few of them um, fossils that is um, available for study and they had not um, too long ago at that point been found. So people hadn't had a chance to really think about it or study them too much. So they thought they were these very clunky, slow lizards. Um, and um, since then, a lot more fossils have been found and people have had, you know, paleontologists have had a lot more time to study them and um, have come up with new ways that they uh, think uh, they looked. So uh, these two um, illustrations, um, the Iguanodon here and the uh, Megalosaurus is here. Um, represent more of what the current thinking of how these um, dinosaurs looked is, uh, which obviously is much different than um, what you see in these these models. Um, so, um, that, so it's just a really good illustration of how uh, scientific thinking changes over time, um, and. So uh, that's it for today, and um, I hope you enjoyed uh, this um, video, and um, we'll um, see you uh, next time. Um, so thank you very much.